Good evening. My name is Janet Parks, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Bowling Green, Ohio. On behalf of the League, I am so pleased to welcome you to Honesty in Education, a panel discussion designed to inform the public pending on Ohio House Bills 322 and 327 and their implications for teaching and learning in our public schools. I want to extend sincere appreciation to the co-sponsors of tonight's program, who include the League of Women Voters of Ohio, the local chapters of the American Association of University Women, Not In Our Town, the Coles Club, and Zonta International, as well as Grounds for Thought, a bowling coffee shop. We're really sincerely grateful for your support. Before introducing the moderator for tonight's program, I hope a bit of context for the discussion. The League of Women Voters is committed to the proposition that education is the bedrock of our democracy. Moreover, we believe that true education is honest, that it includes the complete presentation and critical examination of academic content that is grounded in facts, research, and credible sources. True education reflects diverse perspectives, identities, and experiences. It invites open dialogue and, and debate and appreciation of the complexity of issues. This approach helps to develop lifelong learners who are able to navigate our changing world and help advance society. Honesty in education matters because when educators explore difficult issues, include diverse perspectives, promote self-awareness, and incorporate into their teaching the identities, experiences, and cultures of their students, the learning process is strengthened and educational outcomes are improved. As you know, considerable concern exists with respect to how honesty in education is practiced in Ohio schools particularly with respect to our country's history regarding racism, slavery, sexism, and other potentially controversial topics. Ohioans are asking questions such as, what is currently being taught about these topics? What methods are teachers and administrators using? How do students feel about their educational experiences regarding these issues? How would the pending legislation affect the teaching learning processes and outcomes? In an effort to respond to these and other questions, we've assembled a group of educators, legal scholars, administrators, students, and legislative experts to discuss a variety of issues associated with House Bills 322 and 327 and how the mandates they embody would affect honesty and education. As you might have read in the publicity about this event, local TV commentator Jerry Anderson was scheduled to moderate the discussion tonight. I'm sorry to tell you that Jerry has fallen ill and he's unable to be with us. On the other hand, I'm delighted to tell you that Steve Kendall, known as the voice of WBGU PBS and host of The Journal, their flag public affairs show, accepted our invitation to serve as moderator. Steve has more than 30 years of past experience that crosses various media, including 20 years in the Toledo market and extensive airtime on WBGU PBS. And now, Steve, would you please introduce our panelists and the discussion will begin. Thank you, Janet, and uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters of Bowling Green for the opportunity to moderate this forum on uh, what is an incredibly important topic. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, a couple of things about the forum. The forum is being recorded and will be posted later on YouTube. Uh, you should be able to click CC and get closed captioning. Hopefully that will be working for those who desire that. Uh, as you've heard, we uh, have muted the audience members during the forum. And audience members may also submit questions throughout the through chat box rather. That will be monitored for civility. Uh, if you submit a question, we ask you to keep it brief in length and note to which panel member you would like that question directed. The order of events will begin with two rounds of specific questions addressed to specific members of our panel. And then the audience questions, if submitted by a chat box, will be answered following completion of the first two rounds of those prepared questions. 
Uh, with that taken care of, here are tonight's panelists. Uh, we have Ellie Boyle. Ellie is a freshman at Bowling Green State University, majoring in political science. She recently graduated from Bowling Green High School, where she was a student representative on the Bowling Green Human Relations Commission. She's experienced the events of the past few years as both a student and class, and also a member of the community commission focused on building understanding amid groups in the community. We also have Anna Brown. Anna serves as the Deputy Chief of Diversity, Belonging, and Multicultural Affairs at Bowling Green State University, and also is the coordinator for diversity and retention initiatives for the Office of Residence Life, and is also the Assistant Director for the Sydney A. Rabeau President's Leadership Academy. She has presented numerous workshops on a wide variety of leadership, diversity, and inclusion topics throughout the region. We're also joined by Ariana Bustos. Ariana is a senior at BGSU's Adolescent to Young Adult Integrated Language Arts Teacher Education Program. She's actively involved in different leadership roles, including Director of Student Labor for Undergraduate Student Government, Student Ambassador for the College of Education and Human Development, and Vice President for the Inclusive Culturally Responsive Educators Organization. Her focus is on building accessible, culturally responsible curriculum and resources for students and teachers, especially students and teachers of color. We're also joined by Todd Kramer. Todd Kramer serves as superintendent of Maumee City Schools. He started his career in education 24 years ago, starting as a teacher, later serving as a principal, technology director, curriculum director, and assistant superintendent. Also with us tonight, Clayton Caleb Hughes, known as KH to his students, a veteran history teacher and historian. Clayton taught for five years in the state of California, three years in Ohio Charter School before joining the staff at Bowling Green High School. Clayton teaches US history, including the advanced placement classes. Also on the panel, Patrick Pawkin. Pat currently serves as professor and director of the School of Educational Foundations, Leadership and Policy, and is the interim chair of the Department of Higher Education and Student Affairs at Bowling Green State University. Pat earned a PhD and JD from the Ohio State University. His expertise is in school law, law in higher education, and leadership. And also on the panel, Cynthia Peoples. Cynthia works as a director for the League of Women Voters of Ohio, where she focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Cynthia started her career working as a news anchor and reporter in Texas before moving into the nonprofit world. She has worked with a number of well-known organizations, including Habitat for Humanity, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, San Angelo's AIDS Foundation, the American Cancer Society, and NAACP. That is our panel for tonight, and we will start with the first question in our opening round, and this is directed at Todd Kramer. Uh, Todd, how is Ohio's school curriculum developed? Uh, Dr. Kramer, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Here we go. Thank you very much, Dr. Pawkin. As you see on your screen, uh, there are multiple components to the development of Ohio's curriculum, and this will be my longest answer tonight, I promise. Um, you see the learning standards are at the core, and then we have the model curricula surrounding those standards. And so the way those are developed, this is a graphic straight from the Ohio Department of Education. And so what they do is uh, the Ohio Department of Education puts together advisory groups and working groups. And those groups come together to talk about the standards that need to be developed. And all the while they accept stakeholder feedback. The advisory group then creates draft standards that are then passed along back to the advisory group as well as posted to the Department of Education's website for public comment. All of the meanwhile, the working groups are also providing their input. Uh, these then are released uh, as part of the Department of Education's website as draft revised standards and then go to the State Board of Education for their approval. This whole process usually takes anywhere between nine and 12 months. Uh, the other process that I, I wanna go into real quick is when we talk about model curriculum. So we have the standards and then a layer below that is the curriculum. And you could see, I'm not gonna go step-by-step step with this one, but is it a very similar process? 
that once again involves public comment, uh, final edits, and then once again goes to the State Board of Education. Probably the most important thing I'm gonna show you related to this question is this is what it actually looks like. These are screenshots from the Department of Education. So once again, the learning standards are what do our students need to know um, by the time they leave grade 12? And I'm gonna focus on the history strand number two. And so you see the focus is on early civilizations and the learning standard that has once again been approved by the State Board of Education uh, is listed there. However, if you want to go deeper with the conversation, you need to go to the model curricula. This is really where our teachers, educators work to find out exactly what that standard means, as well as how can I develop an assessment around that standard. So this is that same standard, once again, with that content elaboration and expectations for learning. If you're ever interested in learning more about the standards, you can certainly go to the Ohio Department of Education website. And then the top search bar, all you need to do is simply type in model standards or model curricula, and you can get the answer to that. And then the model curricula are passed down to the individual districts. And this is where curriculum really comes into play, because every district then decides what textbook materials, resources can we best use to teach the content that we need our students to know. And so at the local level, that's where those decisions are made. Um, every Board of Education, and this happens to be the policy numbers from the Mulmey Board of Education, but they are similar across the state of Ohio. So most Boards of Education will have a Board Policy uh, 2220, and that is simply explains the local control uh, application of this, which is the adoption of that course of study. It then goes a uh, layer, uh, one more layer deep. And with the adoption of textbooks. So once again, every board of education has a board policy that they adhere to whenever they're taking a look at those materials. And then the last slide I'm going to share uh, with you, and this is probably the most critical one, is the one that focuses on curriculum development. So once again, at the local level, each school district comes together, typically under the guidance of a curriculum director or curriculum specialist and really discusses what local resources can we best leverage to make sure that our students are learning the curriculum that we are responsible to teach as outlined in that model curricula. So a little long, I promise that is the longest one of the night. I will stop the screen share and thanks again for the question, Steve. Yeah, thank you very much, Todd. Appreciate it. Good explanation of uh, how curriculum is developed and uh, it's, it's not a short process, but it is a very detailed one. Uh, next question uh, goes to Cynthia Peoples. Uh, now that we've heard how curriculum is developed, we'd like a short summary on the uh, on House Bill 327 and also House Bill 322. Cynthia. Hi, thank you. Um, my presentation will not be as short as Dr. Kramer's. <laughs> um, it is going to be pretty detailed, but I will try and rush through it. Um, I'm going to share screen here. And before I do, I just needed to make a quick correction in my bio. I am not the director of the League of Women Voters of Ohio. That would be our phenomenal Jen Miller. She is our ED. I do serve on the board for the um, State League of Women Voters of Ohio. I just wanted to go ahead and make that correction. Thank you. Okay, and good evening, everyone. Um, and I do just want to say thank you to the Bowling Green League for hosting this very important program and warmly thank all of tonight's panelists for their strength and courage to engage in this very complex and complicated discussion. I'm certainly appreciating that many in attendance tonight are all at different places as far as the topic and the discussion goes. Um, and before we dig into the actual Ohio legislation 322 and 327, I just wanna take a moment to point out that 27 states across the country have already introduced or passed similar bills and actions that prohibit or restrict honesty and education, especially in terms of thoughtfully and comprehensively examining race, racism, sex, sexism and other forms of discrimination and identity. Note, that is half the country, more than half the country at this point. So there's obviously a growing political appetite for these bills and actions that cannot be underestimated or ignored. Um, and I do wanna encourage each of you to follow these bills across the country. And you can do that by clicking on a link that Michael Barron's gonna drop in the chat. Um, which he probably just did because he's fast like that. Um, and there will be several chats, uh, links throughout the evening. 
Okay, so here in Ohio, um, those two House bills, 322 and 327, they were introduced in May and uh, quickly thereafter in June, both were referred to the House State and Local Government Committee for review and hearings. Uh, just before the summer recess, the committee did hear sponsor and proponent testimony and in the natural order of things at our State House, opponent testimony would normally be called uh, next. And we do anticipate that the committee will call for opponent testimony shortly after they reconvene from that summer break, which is by the way, next week on September 15th. So what that does is it gives us a little bit of time and a little bit of play to prepare that opponent testimony and we'll dig into that a little bit more later in the program. So taking a look at the screen here, um, we, these two bills, they do have a lot of similarities, certainly in their spirit and their verbiage, yet there are some striking differences as far as their scope and those punitive measures. Uh, you can see that 327 is definitely the more broad of the two bills in that it targets K-12 higher education and those political subdivisions. And for those that aren't familiar with that term political subdivision, that's really just shorthand for state, county and local government agencies. Um, and 327 also, um, you can see there prohibits the promotion of divisive concepts while 322 prohibits the inculcation of controversial content specifically related to race, sex and current event. And you can also see there that 322 um, only hits K-12, which just a note, K-12 does include our community schools and our STEM schools. Okay, so um, now that you've heard a little bit about divisive concepts and controversial content, you're asking, well, what does that mean? So again, much of the language of, and the themes of the bills are similar as you can see in the highlighted portion. And yes, there's a lot of verbiage on the screen and I wanted to pull over a lot of the exact language from the bills so we're not misrepresenting or paraphrasing what the bills actually say. Um, it does look like a big word salad. I apologize for that. Um, but like I said, so you can see in the bolded text that um, the similarities, they do call out things as far as assigning guilt or responsibility to an individual based on their race, sex, religion, et cetera, and the notion that meritocracy and hard work ethics are racist and sexist. Um, some opponents to the bill would actually say that that's kind of a reflexive response to um, the nation really going through this racial reckoning um, right now and really coming to terms with concepts like um, white privilege and, and what that actually means. Um, and some of the finer points here in 322, as you can see, is that 322 really zeroes in on race and sex, like I said earlier, and also highlights um, as a controversial topic, the advent of slavery as the true founding of our nation, and that slavery just below that, slavery and racism are anything other than deviations, betrayals, or failures to live up to our authentic founding principles. Um, that would include liberty and equality. Whereas 327, that it, it goes a little bit more beyond race and sex to actually include nationality, color, ethnicity, and religion um, when it's talking about what, what it prohibits and considers divisive concepts. And you can see at the top there in yellow that it also refutes the notion that America is fundamentally racist. Now, what's interesting is this page. So this is the permissible use page section of uh, 327. And what's really jarring and controversial uh, to opponents of the bills as far as this goes, is that this is where legislators, uh, primary sponsors and co-sponsors actually find their cover for defending this bill and really hang their hats. Um, here 327 states that divisive content and divisive concepts can be presented, but they must be presented in an objective manner and without endorsement. That would include the impartial discussion of controversial aspects of history, I the impartial discussion this, no. of uh, historical oppression, particularly of groups of people based on race, ethnicity, class, nationality, religion, um, and so on. So as outlined, uh, legislators, like I said, they're allowing this controversial content, but they're asking educators to be neutral about it, essentially both sizing um, this content. Things, you know, horrific abuses, murders, undeniable oppression and subjugation when we're talking about things like slavery, suffrage, 
Jim Crow, the KKK, segregation, lynchings. Imagine having a both sides discussion about this. The need for the Great Migration, the Tulsa race massacres, the Holocaust, Japanese internment camps, the civil rights movement. And so this is especially concerning when we're talking about these bills, 327 in particular, applying to the higher education spaces when you're positioning that up against academic freedoms. And then taking a, a little bit of a deeper dive and really looking at where these bills are hitting the education spaces. So like I said, 327 is hitting that K-12 um, higher ed and those political subdivisions. And again, they do overlap a little bit. Um, the, the text in blue under the impacts is where they're a bit similar. For instance, they both prohibit the State Board of Education from adopting any model curriculum regarding prohibitive concepts. A lot of what Dr. Kramer was just alluding to and um, walked through brilliantly. Um, it prohibits the selection, approval, and use of any model or standards of curricula, lesson plans, textbooks, instructional material regarding prohibited concepts, uh, the teaching, instruction, training, advocating, or promoting of divisive concepts, and requiring a student to advocate for or against a specific topic or point of view to receive credit or coursework for graduation credit. Um, and then when we're looking at that professional development, it prohibits that PD, that teaching, instruction, a training of any administrator, teacher, staff, employee of prohibited concepts. And this is where it hits those political subdivisions. So when we're talking about our county prosecutors, office and they're doing anti-bias training or when they're doing inclusion training, um, you know, and looking looking at county, our municipality offices and, and or munis municipal offices, excuse me. And then finally, what that um, funding and purchasing looks like for um, the K-12 higher ed and political subdivisions. It prohibits applying for any federal grants accepting private funding and any expenditures of money for curriculum, instruction, or training about divisive concepts. So looking over at 322 there, um, 322, um, it goes a little further as far as dictating what administrators cannot do as far as it cannot, administrators cannot force a teacher to affirm belief in systemic racism, multiplicity or fluidity of gender identities. That's hitting our LGBTQIA plus communities, um, our students and our um, faculty and staff. Um, administrators cannot require the discussion of current events in classrooms, whether it's widely debated or current controversial issues of public policy or social affairs. And finally, um, schools cannot require uh, that educators award course credit or grades for any type of action civics. And these are things connected to service learning, connected to teaching students how to lobby, how to get engaged in the civic process, how to go to the state house and lobby for the state sugar cookies, things that you know are very low level, but are just getting kids engaged to become active citizens and participate in our representative democracy. Um, and 327, 327 really veers off the rails here as far as when you compare them to when you compare it to 322 when we're looking at the penalties for violations. So 322 does not issue any penalties uh, for violations. Uh, 327 is pretty severe here um, and I just listed four of the main um, penalties here. So uh, for school districts and schools, your first, second, and third violation can incur a withholding of 25, 50 to 100% of your state funding. That is detrimental to a public school, especially when we're thinking about our already under-resourced and underfunded school districts. Um, our administrators, our principals, our supers, our educators, their first, second, and third violations. The first is an admonishment of their professional license. The second is a suspension of their professional license. The third is a revocation of their professional license, their livelihood, what they do for a living, how they impact the classroom and their communities. Um, and then for the higher ed spaces, these violations can impact decisions for tenure can impact decisions for contract renewal or contracts in general. And 
the last one you see there, if you can imagine, is probably the worst of the four. And this is what many are, are calling vigilantism. Um, and this is where the bill permits and encourages uh, parents, uh, guardians, and custodians of students to file civil action against a district, a school, or an individual educator for um, instances where they feel like their student was actually indoctrinated with divisive concepts. And this has really got a lot of educators and administrators terrified. One of the reasons why is because the bill doesn't give a lot of clarifying edification as far as what qualifies as a violation. What, what does that criteria look like? The, the, the bills are, are both pretty vague in that sense. Um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put a pin in it and I'm going to uh, let Steve move on to, uh, to the next presenter um, and we will have some more information as the program moves along. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for the uh, information about 327 and 322. And at the end, of course, you touched on the penalties and, and, and discussion of legal action. And uh, uh, that's a timely thing because our next question is addressed to our, our legal expert on the panel tonight, Pat Pawkin. Uh, and it's a, it's a broad question, Pat. You can, you can move around here a little bit, I'll bet. Uh, you saw some of the penalties. And I guess, is there a way for you to kind of describe how the state may go about enforcing the items that uh, Cynthia just talked about in both of these bills? So um, well, first of all, thank you. And I'll, and I'll thank uh, Cynthia for, for giving such great detail on the bills themselves. Uh, I won't say um, necessarily that you answered the question for me, um, but, but uh, honestly, a lot of what you uh, presented toward the end would have been how I would have started my response. And that's OK. The, um, uh, admittedly, I think Cynthia had, uh, had it correct when, uh, when she said there's not a lot of detail. There's not a lot of clarification on what a violation even means uh, uh, under, under really either one of these bills. The penalties are steep under 327, uh, not a whole lot um, in the way of enforcement in 322. I'll have a little bit more to say later on about, uh, uh, I think, the uh, the legality of the bills themselves uh, and their impact on local control. But I will say this, um, there was one provision in, in 322 that I saw that um, disallows uh, course credit to be given to a student who takes a course where these uh, topics are engaged. In other words, uh, preventing credit toward graduation. Um, uh, and that seemed automatic to me. Uh, um, with respect to enforcement in 327, um, it does give a lot of power to, uh, quite honestly, individuals. State superintendent of public instruction is the person who gets to decide uh, whether violations have occurred um, such that uh, the withholding of state funding uh, would occur. And then there's a, a reference to administrative services, uh, which is where I believe our Ohio Department of Higher Education would come in. And so um, in 327, where higher education institutions are, are impacted. Um, it, it gives a lot of power to individuals. I'll say, um, unfortunately, for, for, for several reasons, but also, and unfortunately, because um, quite honestly, those people, uh, those people in those positions have also not been given that clarity. So um, I might say um, there's not a lot of clarity to the people who are subject to these bills. There's also not a, clar not a lot of clarity given to the people who are, who are required to enforce them. Uh, and, um, and, and that mystery, I'll stop now, but that mystery leads to some commentary that I will make a little bit later on what I believe is the uh, le legality or potential illegality of these bills. I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia and uh, Todd, for, for kicking us off. Okay, yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, and uh, actually, a, a nice segue to our next uh, presenter. Uh, we've heard from a little earlier. Uh, school administrators are placed right in the center of this. Uh, and of course, we have a school superintendent with us, uh, Todd Kramer. Uh, one of the things that probably will come out of this will be you'll have parents which uh, no matter which way whether these bills go into law or aren't put into law uh, will disagree with either outcome and I guess uh, Todd from your perspective uh, how are you going to be able to handle that because it opens up a whole new area that probably superintendents didn't have to deal with nearly as much in the past. You know unfortunately we've been sharpening those skills the last uh, 18 months. I, I will start off with this though I truly hope that we recognize that we have so many great educators, especially in Northwest Ohio. We are, we are blessed to have the institutions of higher education that we do that produce such ready graduates to come into our classrooms. 
And I just certainly hope that parents don't uh, see this as a reflection of an individual teacher and that we continue to support our educators in the classroom because essentially, um, you know, I, I would hope that a parent would uh, come to myself as the leader of the district, as well as then if necessary, our, our board of education to, you know, address that. And I, I look at this as a way for parents to be a role model. Uh, whether you agree or disagree, let's show our youth how you go about healthy discord, how you can voice your opinion, and you may or may not get the outcome you want. But this is a real opportunity, I think, to um, maybe make some changes in the way we've gone about uh, handling when we disagree uh, with laws or mandates that are put in place. Okay, thank you very much. Uh we also have with us a, a classroom educator, that being Clayton Kayla Hughes. Uh, and when we saw the, the bills that were presented as Cynthia put those particular documents up there, uh, a lot of vagueness in content, but very specific on penalties in one case. Uh, Clayton, talk to us about the state standards and what they currently say about teaching multiple perspectives in the classroom. What's the current state of the art? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate everyone uh, for including me in this conversation. I would also highly encourage people to uh, do a, a little bit of research yourself. Go online. It's uh, it's an easy Google. Uh, just uh, just enter in your Ohio state standards. I'm picking history just because that's my thing. Uh, it's the very first uh, Google search result and you'll see a PDF comes up here. And for for the 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 subject that I teach here, American history, it's built upon um, the best visual I can I can present is a spiral, and uh, it's it's ever widening, ever expanding. Uh, but by the time students get to me here in American history at the high school level, they've had um, a, a introduction to this concept of multiple perspectives that's that's built upon it. Um, so for me, it, it's the standards we teach, no more, no less. And the, the standard here is very specific in talking about how students need to uh, be able to, in, you know, talk about uh, analyzing both primary, which is people who were alive at the time, things that were generated uh, during whatever part of history that we're studying, and secondary sources. Um, so for example, uh, today in class, we looked at two different pieces of writing from the period in history that we were studying with two very different points of view on the institution of slavery. Um, those were looked at with the idea that then we're going to be uh, bringing in evidence that will fit with either one of those two perspectives. Tomorrow in class, we're going to be looking at secondary sources. Secondary sources are generated by historians and, and others after the fact who, who are looking back on it with that perspective. And so uh, we'll be looking at two secondary sources tomorrow in class. And again, uh, my job is as much to uh, teach students how to gather evidence, how to uh, apply that evidence to these different perspectives. And so, um, but again, this, this is what the, the standard says, and I would encourage someone to, to look at this, this uh, document that I know Dr. Kramer introduced, um, which, which are widely available there on the website for any and all to see. Um, and and it's, it's really, it's a concept that's introduced early, uh, I believe it's fifth grade, and then it, it builds up through middle school. And by the time they get to high school, this is something that they've seen multiple times before. Great, uh, thank you, Clayton. Uh, also on our panel, excuse me, also on the panel tonight. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, uh, a couple of folks who are, of course, uh, on the receiving end of all of this discussion or participants from a student's perspective. And uh, I guess we ask uh, Ellie Boyles and uh, Ariana Bustos, uh, from their perspective, it is, is it important, in your opinion, to include multiple perspectives in the curriculum of the classroom? And if you could give us some examples or why or why not you think that is important or is not important. So Ellie or Ariana, feel free to step right up. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Um, multiple perspectives are critical in the classroom. As Mr. Cage said, this isn't something new. This is something that we've grown up with is in, these, in these Ohio standards. In government class, we read about the Federalist Papers and Brutus One. Those are two different sources from multiple perspectives, one a Federalist and one an Anti-Federalist. No one has any problems with these teachings of both of these because they're just a part of history. They aren't divisive. We are taught a school curriculum in an argument essay for state testing in order to receive full credit, you need to argue your opinion as well as recognizing a counter argument and explaining why you disagree to prove your credibility, exhibiting multiple perspectives. 
While we may not agree with the counter argument, we still acknowledge it and learn about it. In the Ohio State Standards, we learn about the Cold War and how the USSR and Eastern Europe countries play a role and perspective in the story. So if I'm also required to learn about the Civil War and the aftermath of slavery as part of my curriculum, I should also learn about the perspectives and the feelings of the enslaved people of the time, and not just about how the government had to make rules and amendments to correct their mistakes. Um, I think it is uh, going into, well, starting my fourth year um, in undergrad as a pre-service teacher. Um, I've learned over the past uh, three years that including multiple perspectives is extremely important, not only just in curriculum, but like when you're in the classroom as well. Um, those are things that you have to allow for students to experience because getting the same perspective or getting one, um, one single way of thinking or approaching a controversial topic um, doesn't really allow for students to gather their own opinions or thoughts on a topic. And in education, that's like the number one important thing for students to be doing in a classroom. They should be learning topics where they're able to draw conclusions and opinions based on their own um, gathers, gathering of resources. So to include different perspectives, I think not only just in terms of like resources, but who are those people that are speaking? Are those predominantly white people? Are those, are those predominantly people of color? Like, is there an equal representation of resources that we're providing students in terms of who are we listening to? Who do we want to see in the classroom more? And I think that is one thing that I'm, I've learned that it's, it's really important to let students not only just have those perspectives, but to see those per, those perspectives being played out in their curriculum as well. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, we've talked a lot about content, obviously, and that gets to the heart of, of both of these proposed bills. Uh, and I'm gonna start out addressing this one to uh, uh, Clayton. Uh, and of course, there are other people who can weigh in too, uh, Todd, uh, Anna, Ariana, Ellie. Uh, what are the risks of not teaching what is the truth as we know it in the classroom? What's what is the downside of that? Uh, some people would look at these bills and go, well, that seems perfectly reasonable to me, but what's the downside of, of not being able to teach all of the truth in a classroom? Well, gosh, gosh, for me, that's that's not even how I, be, I begin to, to frame uh, approaching the material. Again, uh, for, for me, it, it all starts with those standards. And so that's really the driving force. Um, there are multiple mechanisms to ensure that I stay on target there, uh, both at the local level, in my building, in my district, uh, all the way up through to the state. And so that's that's where, of course, it gets a, a hard for me to to even sort of, of put it uh, into that point of view uh, because it, it is it's it, it begins and ends with those standards for me we, we again no, we're no more no less and so um that's that's a, that's a different perspective i guess than, than, than the way i view it okay. uh, would anybody else like to respond to that i, Just... I can weigh in here um i i i think that truth uh, can be subjective in the classroom. So for example, is there a you in the words color and neighbor? Um, when they teach about the US revolution in England, how do they teach about it? Uh, when we talk about the battle of Little Bighorn, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy? Um, so there is a lot of subjectivity when we talk about truth and how we answer these questions says a lot about us and our perspectives. What we learn in school shapes us in ways that we don't recognize until we're older. And if we're teaching only part of the story, then we put our students at a disadvantage um, when they're up against other people who do know the whole story. And if we're doing that for the sake of patriotism, that isn't really patriotism, that's nationalism. And that sets us on a really dangerous path that history has shown us time and time again ends very, very poorly. Anyone yeah. else, Todd? Just speaking a dangerous pass, I think, you know, once again, I can't speak highly enough of our educators and I, 
I think that whenever we have an issue that we want to solve, I'm not sure legislation such as House Bill 327 and 322 are the way to solve if there was an issue in one or two particular districts, either across the state or even, you know, slightly more across our country. Um, legislation isn't the answer. Uh, if there's an issue, address it at the local level. Um, Ariana, uh, I know you touched on this in your in your last uh, uh, bit of presentation. Uh, how do you feel about this and and the the discussion of truth in the classroom? Um, thank you. Um, I think like Ms. Brown was saying, um, truth is subjective. Everybody has a different version of truth and the things that have played out in American history. I believe. Um, the biggest thing when it comes to, I guess, trying to decide what truth means in terms of like American history um, is to really like determine different um, perspectives. That goes back to what I was saying before, but you will have people that think slavery was necessary. You'll have people that were abolitionists and you will have both of those perspectives and that will forever be part of American history. And so those people will think it is truthful that slavery was good for America. Then you have people who will think that it was not good. Those are two different types of truth and they will always be subjective because they're two different opinions. Um, so I think teaching truth in a classroom it's really difficult with these bills, I think, to be um, impartial because I don't know how you would teach slavery impartially, um, but that's also where these bills make it really difficult for me to wrap my head around how you would do that in a classroom. But I think just the biggest thing is approaching it in a subjective way. Like everyone will have a different side to what they think the truth is in terms of American history. And uh, Ellie, we'll give you the last word on this if you'd like. Yeah, I definitely agree with Ariana. I think people have to learn these truths in order to form their own opinions. And if you want to be, you know, if you want to build that pride in the country that they're talking about and, you know, not teach the racism and things like that, you have to understand both sides and those multiple multiple perspectives, as Ariana was saying. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for everybody there. Uh, this question, the final one of our, our first phase of questions here goes to uh, Anna Brown. Uh, we've talked about diversity, inclusion, uh, K-12, higher education. Uh, kind of weigh in on your perspective on the importance of including diversity and inclusion at, at those educational levels. I, I think it's extremely important to, to start young in teaching about diversity and inclusion because contrary to what many people believe, children see difference. They see age, they see race, they see disabilities, they see gay couples, they see yarmulkes, they see hijab. The difference is, is they don't attach systems of value to those differences until adults teach them, often inadvertently otherwise. And this education takes place at a very young age. And so it's important to counter those messages in that same time frame, Because if we wait until somebody is 18 or 19 years old, unlearning those ideas is infinitely harder. And it's damaging to all of our children if we don't teach them how to understand and work across difference, especially as technology continues to make our world smaller and smaller. Thank you very much for, for that perspective. Uh, we're gonna wade back into the uh, legal side a little bit in terms of a discussion now, and this will go to Pat Palkin first. Uh, the term local control is mentioned uh, as, a, as one of the strong points of, of the state of Ohio's way of dealing with all sorts of uh, activities. Uh, talk about what, Pat, what you think these bills, how they would affect local control in the schools a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, and my goodness, uh, I am blessed to be a part of all of you tonight. Uh, those responses earlier were fantastic. Um, uh, I will do my best to, to share the screen. I'm not, I, I hope I won't spend um, uh, too terribly long, but um, but I also have um, a couple uh, former students here, so they're already going to tell you. Um, 
With that said, uh, um, I'll offer some thoughts here uh, uh, as well. And so what's the impact on local control? Um, this is a legal statement as well. So I know it's a practicing one, but very long, there's a very long standing doctrine that states control curriculum for K through 12 schools. There's also a long standing tradition that would have that tradition move to local levels for the day to day decision making and implementation. And, and uh, Dr. Kramer mentioned some of this a little bit earlier, the hiring and evaluation of teachers, the teaching and assessment of students, the actual development of curriculum and lesson plans. And, and these bills enhance state level control, and I think significantly so, and as a result with great peril to public education. And so I ask um, several questions. Um, the definitions that Cynthia presented earlier uh, of these leading terms are already broad enough, but who decides what prohibited and divisive is? Who decides when a person or entity crosses the line? And how does that decision maker or educator even know what that line is? Um, does such guidance come in these required policies that the administrative heads are supposed to write, but where is the guidance for the administrative heads to write them, as I mentioned earlier? Currently controversial. Who decides what current is? How, um, how does the definition change? Does it change daily, weekly, monthly, current as of the effective date of the law, or whenever future power decides? Widely debated. Who decides that? How wide does the debate have to be to be determined widely debated? Um, when is wide measured? Is it allowed to ebb and flow? And so from that, if you are a local educator or educational leader and you are subject to these bills and you cannot answer the previous questions, and if you are now afraid to do the lawful job the state has empowered you to do, which is public education, then I believe you have lost local control and potentially the respect that you used to have. Uh, and there are many undefined terms, high stakes and chilled free speech. And so I'm going to spin from local control into where I think um, the legality of these bills will fall. Um, the word vagueness was thrown around a little bit earlier. That's also a legal term under the 14th Amendment due process clause. And all the quotes that I will share with you are from US Supreme Court cases. If people of common intelligence must guess at, must guess at an enactment's meaning and then differ as to its application, the law is unconstitutionally vague and is void. I know there are long bulleted lists of what prohibited concepts are and what divisive concepts are. Um, this does not prevent, in my opinion, the vagueness. Accordingly, an enactment must define the prohibited conduct with sufficient definiteness such that an ordinary individual understands just what conduct is prohibited and then must define that prohibited conduct in a manner discouraging arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. I will argue that the language of these bills um, uh, is vague. And to that end, uh, uh, violation, uh, violative of the First Amendment. I'll point out a couple, uh, um, a, a few U.S. Supreme Court cases. I'll try to keep this moving along pretty quickly. Um, one of the one of the things that I find fascinating about uh, about the the Supreme Court law that brings us to these points is this Supreme Court law is equally long standing. Uh, 1923 is not a typo. Meyer versus Nebraska, post-World War I state law that prohibited the teaching of German, which was likely a then current and widely debated subject. The Supreme Court struck down that law. Uh, there's a due process liberty interest, and liberty is used in the bills as one of, you, of, of one of the founding principles of our U.S. There's a due process liberty interest, uh, and that contains the right to acquire useful knowledge. From Meyer versus Nebraska, the court did recognize the state's authority to prescribe a curriculum for its schools, no problem there, but, um, but then says no emergency has arisen which renders knowledge by a child of some language other than English so clearly harmful as to justify its inhibition. Uh, and, and, and I think there is some parallel to the state law in, the, in, in 1923 to the laws that are being proposed today. Board of Ed versus PICO, this is a, a case about the removal of library books from a school library. The court has long recognized that local schools um, have broad discretion in the management of school affairs. I'm okay with state control over, over curriculum generally. At the same time, however, we have necessarily recognized that the discretion of the states and local school boards in matters of education must be exercised in a manner that comports with the transcendent imperatives of the First Amendment. And this is where I think um, these proposed bills uh, may fail. A um, Couple other quotes. Our precedents have focused not only on the role of the First Amendment in fostering individual self-expression, but also on its role in affording the public access to discussion, debate, and the dissemination of information and ideas. I cannot emphasize enough tonight this idea of, of, uh, of having a right 
to the receipt and the dissemination of information and ideas. The state may not contract the spectrum of available knowledge. This is huge and very much alive. PICO and the right to receive ideas. So if students have the right to receive ideas, where would those ideas come from and who would provide that forum? Local educators and leaders. The right to receive ideas follows ineluctably from the sender's First Amendment right to send them. So as much as those previous quotes were talking about the students' access to knowledge and ideas, we also then have to provide teachers and school leaders the forum to provide uh, the, well, the opportunity to, to, to search, to discover, and to share those ideas. It would be a barren marketplace of ideas that had only sellers and no buyers. Such access prepares students for active and effective participation in the pluralistic, often contentious society in which they will soon be adult members. So if, if we have bills that prevent teachers from, from talking about ideas in contentious society, then we are not preparing students for participation in it. That is, that's a significant chill on free speech and quite honestly, a freeze on the access to ideas, discovery, learning, and growth. A couple things before I stop. Um, higher education is, uh, is not immune to these conversations as well. Anyone who knows me at all knows I love this quote. Um, I wish I could claim it as my own, um, uh, but, this, but this is from a 1957 case, Sweezy versus New Hampshire. No field of education is so thoroughly comprehended that new discoveries cannot yet be made. If we do not provide forums, however, for those new discoveries, then those new discoveries will not be made. The, the conversation earlier about the gloriousness of truth being subjective and having the opportunity to enter a forum to, to seek, discover, and share that um, is lost if these bills are passed. Our civilization will stagnate and die. The First Amendment would not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. A classroom is per peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. That I believe is it for now. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much. You know, I love my meet the press. Got to bring in my Supreme Court quotes. Um, I uh, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Pat. The uh, discussion is better for all of those quotes you did. So appreciate that very much. Uh, we'll we'll shift back now. We we've talked about again uh, the bigger pictures and some of these other concepts, but again, it will come back down to local school administrators, and of course. Uh, We'll uh, direct this question to the uh, member of the panel who uh, specifically is that. Uh, as a superintendent, how would you view how you would go about enforcing the items that are listed in these bills? How would you go about doing that in, in Maumee City Schools? You know, this would represent a significant shift from our current board policies and positions. I mean, right now I have our, our board policy up in front of me. And, you know, we say that we believe that the consideration of controversial issues has a legitimate place in the instructional program in our schools. And, you know, we have considered controversial topics, those that have support and opposition, they may have two sides or they may just have different views. And we've always encouraged staff to invite, explore and provide those multiple perspectives uh, when they exist on any topic. And I guess I would just hate to think uh, that should a student uh, ask about a certain topic uh, that we would say, oh, we're not allowed to talk about that and that we would lose a lot of those teachable moments that occur in our classrooms and probably are some of the most memorable for many of us um, in school. So, you know, we have current policies in place and we follow those policies and we enforce those policies. That's part of our job. And um, if th these bills were passed or either bill were passed in its current form, it would reflect once again a significant shift. And uh, you may see individuals uh, making career choices um, around uh, that because if you were to take away someone's freedom and liberty that they have now uh, in the classroom or their ability to really support educators, we don't wanna turn this into um, looking to catch people or enforcement. Okay. Very good. Uh, We'll, we'll shift to someone who is a lifelong educator in the classroom and, uh, of course, has been a lifelong history teacher. Uh, Clayton, talk about uh, how you go about discussing potential divisive or controversial issues and, and what the upside is and, and what may be, in some people's mind, the downside to that. Um, how do you handle that in your classroom when you come up with an issue that could potentially be divisive? 
Well, again, I just want to build off of, of some of the excellent points made by the, the previous panelists talking about uh, part of the educational process is to not have people complete, you know, K through 12 education, go out into the world and not have had a chance to, to become exposed to some of these uh, diverse device topics and to uh, start to, to, to work on how, how they're going to build their relationship with them. Um, so a little bit of kind of background. I'm not only an English teacher, I'm duly licensed in both English and history. I have taught courses, English specific courses, uh, which, which have had some of these, these controversial novels, for example. Uh, but I believe strongly in interdisciplinary education. Um, in, in fact, I, I'm currently a teacher in a, a joint English and history class because I believe that when you're teaching these, um, there, there's a couple of requirements. First of all, you need to create a, a space that is safe. It is something that is, uh, you know, to paraphrase Dr. Pockin, uh, unique to the educational process where we can carve out a place where, where people's uh, opinions are free to sort of develop and, 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 and mature in a way that um, it, it is special to the educational process. And that is vital because these, these are topics that once they do leave the schoolhouse are going to be things that, that are, are no longer going to be forgiving for them to sort of uh, mature their, their opinions within it. And so uh, the, the, part, um, the, the two parts are building a, a context in which uh, students can explore these, uh, the, these concepts in a, in a safe place. And then secondarily, you, you can't just present a novel without sort of uh, giving it its, its background, its due. Uh, the history, the English, and, and, and really all the subjects, they, they, they balance off of each other. And so it, it's, it's vitally important to teach that background because that's, that, that is the, the world that, that we are, are, are putting these students into. Yeah, and, and kind of a follow-up to that, um, if you, would be teaching under one of these bills, uh, how would that change? How, you, you sort of explained it, but how would it change? Would you be able to teach the way you currently are in any form or fashion or not? I, it, it, it certainly depends on, on how the, uh, the, the standards, again, you know, just to keep banging on the standards drum there, uh, how, how they, 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 because they have to be rectified, of course, at the, at the state board level. It's a, it's a, it's a multi-year process. It depends on what they say, but boy, just my instincts are, I'm, I'm going to be much less comfortable uh, with, with having these, these kinds of conversations, which I personally believe are vital to helping People develop into you know young adults who are able to participate in the democratic process and and to be you know vital American citizens. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that perspective uh, from the classroom. Uh, we're going to lean back on our legal and, and school administrators for a second. Uh, and of course, the word inappropriate in that I'm in this question is is rather vague. And I guess Pat will will talk about vagueness again for us, but. Uh, what would happen should a teacher inappropriately emphasize one point of view in a discussion that might be covered by either one of these bills? How, how would you deal with that, uh, uh, Mr. Kramer, or Superintendent Kramer, in that, in that situation? Uh, you know, uh, like anything, it depends on where it falls on that spectrum. Um, and once again, depending on the way the law comes out. But, you know, our goal always is to develop that mutual understanding of what the expectations are, right? And so um, often try not to go down a, a punitive route rather than learn together. Let's have a conversation about what the expectations are and how can we get there. Um, so that would be the, the chosen route. Dr. Pawkin, maybe you can lend a little more from a legal perspective or, or your... Yeah, and I appreciate that. The um, The... That I always I am maybe because because of the the hat I'm wearing, but I go back to that um, who has control over the curriculum and and in many regards it's a good thing that we have some standards right that um, that there that there is something that educators um, whether they be classroom teachers or school administrators um, can can lean on to to guide the teachers in the appropriate. Um, uh, implementation of their of their lessons and of the, and of the curriculum uh, what I what I, I think we fail to miss uh, we fail to see I'm sorry sometimes is um, there's a Supreme Court case it's it, um, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer. it's a, it's about student newspapers uh, and and their and their alleged uh, um, free speech in uh, in school sponsored activities um, I, I like the I like the, the ruling but but I'm afraid we over apply it if, if it if, if it says that educators maintain uh, 
uh, um, control over the content and style of student and, and, and by impl implication other educator speech in school sponsored activities um, that restrictions can be made on such speech if they are reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. I don't have a problem with the basic statement that says we, we are allowed to restrict uh, speech inside school sponsored activities with legitimate pedagogical concerns. What I don't want our educational leaders and teachers to, um, to miss is um, that they still have the control. And so I loved what, what Todd just said, right? Work with it with a teacher um, who, who, who wants to, to uh, engage students in the, in the discussion of what might be uh, divisive or controversial topics, but then how do we do that in a way uh, that respects everyone's rights there? Um, it's not about the, oh, here you go. We're gonna have to shut you down. You, no, you don't. You just have to, uh, you, you have to, to bring the educators in, trust their knowledge base, trust their pedagogy and, and um, legitimate pedagogical concerns are shouldn't necessarily shouldn't always be tools for restriction right um, uh, just because you can it doesn't necessarily mean you should um, particularly when 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 I'm talking about myself as now a veteran prof um, if and I'm going to shut up I promise if I, if I don't if I don't um, mute myself and back off there's a lot of cool ideas that I'm about to miss uh, and and so if I'm a department chair here and I am uh, and, and I hear a curricular story down the hall um, I don't want to go punitive either, even if, even if I might have the contractual authority to do so. I may miss out, uh, and I don't want to miss out. Uh, so I, uh, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Yes, we have some of that uh, authority, but we need to be careful about how we use it too, not just for the teachers. And, and Pat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one at you that isn't on the prescribed list at the moment. Uh, in the classroom, would a discussion about House Bill 327 under its current description be considered divisive and controversial and all of the things that are described there? Would we be able to even talk about this in a classroom under these bills? Uh, you, you know, I have more PowerPoint slides than I've shown, right? So yeah, um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a point to be made there as well. Yeah, I, and I think that was a question in the chat as well. Um, just just the, the introduction of this bill would be a currently widely debated topic. And I might argue, um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong technically, but let's, let's uh, pretend for a minute that the General Assembly is also one of those state agencies. Good point, good point. Uh, we're going to lean back on our, uh, our students and also uh, Anna Brown. Uh, talk to us again about, uh, and I know we've touched on this a little bit, multiple perspectives in the classroom. Um, Anna, under, under, these, under these bills, or either one of them, uh, how would you go about doing what you do currently at the university? Because when you talk about diversity and you talk about in inclusivity, uh, it almost seems that these bills don't really want you to go there. So talk a little bit about how you see your role in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an arena where this would now be the. Um, one of the bills has language that is very, very similar, almost exact to the presidential order that was signed um, in, what was it, 2018, uh, 2019, and it, it put a standstill on some of the educational sessions that I was about to do because we didn't want to violate an executive order um, by, by proceeding in some of this, the language that, that they are prohibiting. So um, it, it, it really inhibits my ability to do my job appropriately. And, and if I am doing my job appropriately, it's, it's, people should not feel guilt or shame in what I am teaching. They should be thinking about their perspectives and their roles. And so if someone is intentionally making people feel guilty, they're not really doing inclusion education. Um, and that, that is one of the things that I think a lot of people miss when we're having conversations about these topics. So, so I, my hands would be very, very tightly tied in, in the work that I do um, if these bills would pass. And, uh, and Ellie, from the student's perspective, uh, in a classroom where topics would be almost, I think as Pat said, no, we've got to, we can't talk about that today. Um, 
how would you approach that as a student? I mean, what talk about the benefit. Is there a risk to talking about a divisive topic in the classroom from your perspective, Ellie? Yeah, so I would say um, some of the risks I've just seen in my short time here at college. Um, I was talking with Anna the other day and I didn't know about the move Philadelphia bombings until she had told me about them. That's not something I was taught in the classroom. And this has happened in a lot of your lifetimes. These aren't things that are being cut for time in class or anything like that. These are current events um, that we're just missing out on. You know, we have the Tulsa bombing, like someone mentioned earlier, and the Mississippi flooding. And these are just things that aren't being taught in our classroom. Um, some benefits, I guess, to teaching these multiple perspectives are teaching a fuller version of our country's history. Students deserve to know what happened and then are able to draw their own assumptions. I know a lot of the worries of this bill are, you know, it's going to teach people not to love America or something like that. But you can't love something if you don't know what it really is. And right now you're just teaching a small percentage of what it really is with these bills. I'm sorry, Ariana, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think when I first saw these bills, I started to talk about them with Dr. Fry, Dr. Nancy Patterson, and other people in my cohort and colleague. And I run an organization at BGSU called Inclusive Culturally Responsive Educators. And it started in 2020 by two teachers of color. And it worries me to think that we wouldn't be able to continue as an organization because so many people um, being in a career field that's predominantly white, um, I'm one of the only women of color in my entire senior program, uh, AYAI LA program. So to not have that sort of like um, safe space for teachers and pre-service teachers of color um, to have these conversations about legislation or um, systemic issues in education or prejudicial teaching practices, like we would not be able to really have uh, many of those conversations that we wish to have as an organization. And that's something I've really thought about um, that these bills might kind of hinder that process, that learning process. And that does make me very nervous. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much for that perspective as a, as a student and, and someone active in this area. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Cynthia Peoples to come back in. Uh, we talked about the content of these bills. We've talked about uh, what they may or may not do uh, and the vagueness in some cases. Uh, if someone wants to weigh in on this with the uh, elected officials in Columbus who will be making a decision on these bills, so Cynthia, uh, what's the best way for them to make their voices heard either in support or in opposition to them? Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. You know I want to talk about this. I've got some more slides, so let me uh, screen share real quick. It's only one though. Okay. Yeah, so we absolutely want everyone to get engaged. Um, and like I said earlier, um, when I spoke, the General Assembly will be reconvening. Um, the Senate reconvened on the 8th or will, today's the 8th, reconvene today. House reconvenes uh, next week on the 15th. So as I mentioned earlier, that is giving us a little bit of time to draft our opponent testimony. And the great news is that the ACLU Ohio is partnering with Honesty for Ohio Education to do a testimony workshop. And Gary Daniels, who is the chief lobbyist for ACLU Ohio, will walk through how to draft, how to write, and how to actually present that testimony because it can be incredibly intimidating to think about the idea of going to the state house and just being vulnerable and raw with um, with either your expertise or just your lived experience to a room full of legislators. So um, he'll he'll walk through that, and I think Michael Barron's going to drop that link in the chat. I encourage everyone to jump on that. It's great information. He goes into high level detail, much more than I did about the bill. Um, we also want to encourage people to submit letters to the editor. Our local media, our state media, is one of the best places for you to do public advocacy. It is the court of public opinion. It is where you can get your own perspective across, where you can bring in your own lens of expertise. Um, you can hit one of the major papers, the dispatch, uh, cleveland.com, Cincinnati Inquirer, um, Dayton Daily News, or you can hit your own local, your daily or your weekly readers um, and the digital copy as well. We do encourage people to contact the state and local government committee members. Um, you know, 
because the way our state house is right now, it is a super majority of Republicans. So um, by nature, our that state and local government committee is also predominantly Republicans. We do have some moderates on there um, that would like to hear your thoughts. Um, and um, we do have some folks that are not co-sponsors on the bill. Unfortunately, the chair of the state and local government committee is a co-sponsor on the bills. So that's gonna be a little bit more of a, a tug and pull as far as um, convincing him. And then contact your own local legislators as well. Um, your own uh, state senator, your own state representatives, um, your city council members, your county council com uh, commissioners, um, reach out to all of the legislators you can because word can trickle up. Um, you reach out to your local legislators and um, you don't know who, who they converse with in their own circles. We do have toolkits for that and Michael will drop the link in the chat where it can walk you through um, how to do that opponent testimony. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a template for how to write those letters to the editor and op-ed if you're not familiar um, and then how to reach out to those different legislative members. And then also we want to encourage people to stay informed. Uh, this is almost a daily saga. Once the legislators reconvene, it's going to turn quickly. So one of the ways you can stay informed is uh, keeping up with the League of Women Voters of Ohio and then Honesty for Ohio Education. Michael will dream, drop those links in the chat as well for those websites. We feature upcoming events where you can learn more about these bills. We have action alerts. Um, we have dedicated resources and all of the, the latest news. And finally, we want to encourage everyone to share what you have learned, whether it's in this space or in another forum, in another panel, if you have a great read. Um, it, it's surprising to me how many people don't know about this, but I live and breathe this. So when I hear someone doesn't know, it's, I grab them and sit them down. No, I have to tell you. So share share what you learn. Um, it ultimately, it it's going to impact your students. It'll impact your family. It's going to in impact the economic development of the state of Ohio. I'm mean, talking about our workforce right now. Um, we have an international global workforce right now. And some of the key indicators for job skills are those social, emotional learning and interpersonal management skills. As we're moving to a more and more automated workforce, those interpersonal skills, multiculturalism are going to be more and more important for us to advance. Um, economically and uh, socially. Okay, great, thank you very much for that. Uh, this would be the section I believe we do still have some time left and uh, I will demonstrate my lack of technical expertise here. I know we uh, said we would accept chat uh, questions via chat uh, and I believe we probably do have some. Um, I may need a little help uh, having those shared so that we can ask those questions if there are some out there. So. Uh, uh, is someone able to assist me with that or not? Uh, I'm looking at the chat room, but I don't think those are the questions uh, that are in there. Okay. There were a couple comments um, uh, in the in the chat, comments and questions about about other subjects. Even you know the right. um, the the first thought we might have is about um, the teaching of social studies and history. But um, but but with respect to language arts and to foreign language and um, art and and uh, and music and really any other subject, there was a, a reference to sociology and psychology. Um, those uh, those subjects, just like um, just like history and social studies, are 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 there to to be examined to be explored with new truths to discover. Uh, and so um, I, would, I would argue that all of those subjects are um, uh, um, just as uh, viable in these conversations as, as the first ones we might think of. And uh, just, oh, go ahead. Apologies. Uh, I just want to add on to another layer of complication, if you will. Um, so of course, I, I, uh, my objective is, is to have students uh, work towards those Ohio standards, but I'm also uh, a, a someone who has to uh, do my best to, to get students uh, to achieve the uh, advanced placement, the, the, uh, the AP standards as well. Those are not written by the, the State Department of Ed or, or anything like that. Uh, those are, are created by a national group, which is independent of this legislation. Um, currently, the, the Ohio State Department of Ed 
uh, incentivizes students doing well on those AP exams, and that's reflected on uh, one of the metrics we use for measuring uh, how districts are performing in those district report cards. And so if there were to be an instance where we're no longer able to teach certain standards which are present on the AP curriculum, then students won't do well on the AP exams, which again are written by a national group, and that will also negatively impact individual districts and the state of Ohio in general. Um, I know that I am not the only, uh, but the AP program is not the only program in our building. Uh, I've spoken with uh, colleagues in, in DECA. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident that FFA also have national organizations which create standards independent of what the state legislatures say and could come into direct conflict with this potential. Um, Ariana, I believe you wanted to weigh in here. Yeah, I saw someone's question um, in the chat and it stood out to me. Um, it was from Zachary Carpenter and I'm just gonna read it. Um, As a non-binary student soon starting medical transition, my very existence is going to be a divisive issue. My question is what happens when my self-advocacy enters the classroom? If my existence is divisive or divisive, sorry, how am I to be affirmed and supported by educators? And how am I to trust my educators to stand up for my rights in the classroom? The same applies to other marginalized groups. Um, and as a student, like currently right now, I really hold the student um, perspective since I'm not a full-time teacher and I'm still my undergrad. Um, my biggest concern with these bills is we like to look at like a larger lens. And I think that's like really great looking at everything that's happening um, with legislation and like getting really technical and nitty gritty. But when you get down to it, like who is it directly affecting? It's affecting these non-binary students. It's affecting black and brown students. And to know what that would be doing directly to those students. And like like we, we talked about testimony a little bit, that's, that's their voice that they get to share about how that's affecting them. Because um, I think it's really great we focus on like uh, the technical aspect of it, but just to, hear a person that is also expressing concern as a student, like you go into a classroom, your presence might be something that you can't even learn about. Like, that's how I feel with these bills. I may not even be able to learn about my own culture. I may not be able to learn about Mexican culture. I may not be able to learn about African-American culture. And that's really scary to think about. Um, and if we do learn about it, it might be a watered down version. So what am I supposed to do with, um, uh, I guess, teachings that may not be um, as true as they're supposed to be or as um, educational as they're supposed to be. And I just thought that question was really important because also the bill directly does, um, I'd say go after LGBTQ plus um, students, especially with the language that they use. Thank you. And I, um, I have been able to find the chat questions now, so my apologies for that. Uh, here's one of the questions that came in, um, and I, I won't uh, uh, credit the people who are uh, sending these in, but uh, one of the chat room questions or comments is, I agree with the panelists that teaching all sides of an issue is important. However, I don't see where presenting both sides of history is being discouraged in either of these bills. Can someone point out how this is the view that is being expressed, to paraphrase the question a little bit. So does anybody want to weigh in on uh, that? Because we have, we have a viewer, a participant who says uh, he or she does not believe that either of these bills would discourage the discussion of multiple sides of an issue. So who, who would like to jump in on that one? Well, I can share with what I've heard so far. Um, with some um, of the public believes that this bill has already passed. And so what it leads to is people uh, to really look at the values they embrace and anything that is counter to that is considered divisive. And so that could be applicable to history as, as we heard. Um, and honestly, if we were sitting here probably six to eight years ago, we would have been talking about science standards. And, and what should we be teaching in science education? And so while the focus may shift over the years, it's really the application and the unnecessary uh, really creation of this legislation that sets a path that's dangerous for us as a state moving forward. 
and I would also argue that um, uh, Ariana's um, example from from Zachary from earlier um, would then what obligate a teacher um, to offer some kind of counter position to his own position, which doesn't make any sense at all. But if you read the the definition uh, in the in the bills of divisive and prohibited concepts, um, the allowance would then require me to talk about what the opposite of I, I I'm not sure I know what that what that means. And, and so it would stop a teacher in their tracks um, uh, after it has already stopped a student in their tracks. And so where those lines are drawn or how those lines are drawn um, gives more trouble to this idea of, of teaching both sides. Um, I'm actually in full favor on, on many topics talking about uh, uh, objective arguments on, on multiple sides. That's how we, that's how in some cases we find knowledge, but in others um, it, it doesn't seem workable at all. But this bill would require a teacher to stop that student either from talking at all or stop that student and then address somehow Oop, you're about to get divisive um, i don't know what that means um, because the student was really just being the student right presence is not divisive and so so it's it's hard to read the law and uh, the bill and, and and know how to implement it uh, the question that we got with respect to this multiple perspectives is actually a pretty good one, but it, but I but I don't find these bills allow that comfort in in all situations, but would honestly um, uh, give us really a lot of trouble from the teacher's perspective, from the administrator's perspective, and certainly from the students. Um, and we're going to obviously apologize to people who are in the chat room or posted things. Uh, we're not going to get to everybody's question, but I'll uh, I'll pose this one. And we sort of talked about it a little bit. Uh, someone asked, what are the implications of teaching novels such as The Hate You Give or even To Kill a Mockingbird? Could you look critically at those issues raised in the text and how they would intersect in our real lives or how they would intersect with current events and issues? It's a good question. Uh, if you tried to teach To Kill a Mockingbird or went through that and posited it up against current events, would you be allowed to do that in this in the under, under 327 or 322? That's, a, that's an open question. Uh, uh, I don't know, Clay Clayton. Would you be willing to to weigh in on that one? Well, and, and sure, and 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 it's it's a bit to kind of uh, kind of uh, add on to Dr. Pock in there. Um, it's it's not necessarily that. Um, is it, I know I saw the KKK and teaching the alternative KKK, for example. It. At least the way it stands now is 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 you you would approach it more as multiple perspectives on on how the KKK came about. It's not you know we we have to somehow create a, a the KKK as a positive point of view. More um, it's how do historians go about um, explaining the rise of the KKK and and sort of where they're they're fitting it in with like the larger narrative, not necessarily giving a thumbs up, thumbs down, a positive and negative uh, um, to that particular point of view. And so the, this, the same kind of uh, piece would arrive for the, the hate you give or Mockingbird or whatever, where you're, you're gonna be talking about issues that uh, are, are, are intentionally making people feel uncomfortable. And, and then the multiple perspectives piece would fit in in terms of how, how did people arrive at this discomfort? Um, what Social economic factors brought us to this point, and multiple perspectives on how how we got there would, would be more of how you would frame it. Thank you, and I'm, I'm going to delve into a question here that probably is is going to be a little off, a little bit, but maybe part of this conversation. Uh, the discussion of critical race theory has entered the chat room, and uh, with the discussion that uh, isn't it wrong to teach, and I, I know we're paraphrasing how people describe this and, and someone's opinion of what critical race theory is versus what it may actually be. Uh, but their question is, isn't that, isn't critical race theory an indoctrination or a, a viewpoint that should not be allowed or should it, could it, would it also be considered decisive enough not to be allowed to even discuss critical race theory in a classroom, the potential for that as a curriculum item? I'm not sure who wants to. Pat, is that is that you? Maybe to talk about that, or or maybe uh, Superintendent Kramer. 
I, uh, you know, you, you mentioned my name first. I am not a critical race theorist um, by any deep knowledge, um, but um, I would argue that uh, critical race theory is not currently taught in K through 12 uh, schools um, with no intention to do so. Um, uh, certainly my, my superintendent and principal friends uh, um, would, uh, would attest to that, not just those who are on the, uh, on the call tonight, but, um, but certainly those that I've gotten to meet with um, uh, over the years. And it said, or um, one of the chats, or in a higher ed outside of law school. And, and um, there is, uh, there is a, um, a neatness and a goodness inside law school, and I am a law grad, um, for for, for questioning um, not just the, the language of, of law, of statutory law, for example, but, um, but, but the origin of the system that gave us those laws in the first place. Um, it, is, it is not lost on any of us that um, uh, wealthy white men were the first and only voters. Uh, um, and, and, and we can talk about other amendments to the Constitution um, that give rights to, to other humans uh, in, our, uh, uh, in, in our system, but that system uh, that welcomed them was not divide, de, uh, designed by them or even in part by them. And so, so, so give, having an opportunity to, uh, um, to, to question origins like that really is important for us. But that, but that conversation, um, and I don't know, I'm not an expert on the state standards themselves in K through 12, um, but, uh, but to my knowledge, that is not one of them. No, and I found the most meaningful part of the conversations when people have mentioned critical race theory is just to ask, tell me what you mean by critical race theory. And then it allows that deeper conversation. What are your concerns about what you believe may be taking place in our classrooms? And uh, I can tell you without a single exception, it's always been based on myth or, or hearsay. It is relative concern to the person that is reaching out. And I, you know, I think all superintendents, administrators, and teachers understand that. The per, the, those individuals reaching out are sincere in their concern. However, it, it usually is just not founded in anything that is uh, grounded in truth. Uh, there's also an, an a discussion, of course, with the legality question. And I know that Pat, we're gonna keep leaning on you a little bit for that. Uh, someone asked, and it's, it's been responded to a little bit in the chat room, um, if there are so many Supreme Court cases, US Supreme Court cases out there that contradict these bills, uh, how can they even become law? And, and what then happens should they become law? What will be the, pro the possibilities after that? Uh, but this person saying, if, the, if this is unconstitutional according to the Supreme Court, how can bills like this even be written? No, and I appreciate that. Uh, um, one of the, um, you know, obviously my argument tonight is that the bills uh, are not written clearly uh, um, and directly enough for us to follow. And that, that raises a vagueness question, which then raises um, uh, a First Amendment question. Um, however, that first question really is about the state's power to or state's authority to, um, to direct curriculum. And so the first question really is not a federal law First Amendment, as much as I love all that, um, it really is about, about state law and, and the authority that the state has to, uh, um, to control its curriculum. If that state, however, crosses federal lines, um, as I like to say, uh, the union won the war. Uh, um, federal law will supersede uh, state uh, if state crosses. And, and so, so uh, a challenge to bills like this would like likely come not only under state law, but also under federal law. Um, it's going to take some time, admittedly, if the bills um, are ultimately passed and become law, but those challenges should be about, um, okay, state, you've told us what to do, but have you really told us what to do? And um, and, and confining um, activity where it is supposed to be confined is lawful. It's it's the, the problem comes when those when, when the uh, the provisions are written so broadly that you are not only confining activity where it should be confined, you're you're confining activity where it never should have been confined in the first place. That's the part where where, where the lack of uh, of legality uh, comes to play. So I'm fine following lawful rules, but what you've done is you've hampered my ability to do what I should have been doing in the first place because I'm afraid that if I address Zachary in a classroom, or someone like Zachary, right, that I'm going to violate a law. My hunch is they'll come back and say, that's not what we meant. And then I'll have to go back to them and say, yeah, that's kind of what you wrote. Uh, and, 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 and that's, and that's what that that's, that's the conversation that will have to occur. I want all these conversations, by the way, to occur away from courtrooms. 
I don't want us to go there, right? Uh, th these conversations are much more alive when there's not um, a, a gavel. And, and this will be our last question because we are gonna be short on time here in a moment. Uh, someone writes, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here. Um, if these discussions that become divisive or deal with multiculturalism, whatever the case may be, make someone in the classroom feel guilt or shame, is that appropriate for that student to, to be made to feel that way? And I know that's not a very good way. I, I didn't do a very good job of it, but that's their question. If we don't have some sort of, in their mind, some sort of guidelines like are being described maybe in 327 or 322, um, is it fair for someone to be made to feel uncomfortable in a classroom because now they feel like they are responsible for some of the divisive issues that are being discussed. And that, and again, I, I think we'll have to lean on our educators for that a little bit. I don't know, uh, uh, Superintendent Kramer, uh, Clayton, uh, if you have any comments on that or not. The only thing I'll say real quick is we have uh, current policy and guidelines around students, the way we treat, the way we interact with students. And so I'm not sure this bill really addresses that. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Clayton for more of the classroom application. Uh, I think uh, Anna had a, a comment first, please. Well, as, as somebody who identifies as Black growing up in rural Northwest Ohio, um, I was made to feel uncomfortable in the classroom a lot with the way things were taught. And so I think that framing it from one perspective, I, again, why don't we flip the script a little bit? It's like, who's being made uncomfortable now? by the way things are taught or by what's being taught? Who is uncomfortable in the classroom now by what's being omitted in what we're not teaching our students? And not saying that turnabout is fair play, that's not what I'm saying at all. I think that discourse is important for growth, but if only one group of people constantly feels that they are being left out of the conversation or they're being made uncomfortable, then that's a problem that we haven't yet addressed that we need to address. And that is gonna cause other people to feel uncomfortable, yes. But growth happens when we're in moments of discomfort. Growth doesn't happen when we're stagnant and when we're sitting very comfortably in our cushy chairs. It helps us when sometimes when we're sitting in a little bit of a harder chair with a little bit of a straighter back. And so I would challenge folks that are so worried about students who may become uncomfortable with these topics to look at what students are uncomfortable right now. And I, very good. And, and thank you so much for, for yeah, flipping the script on that a little bit. I think that does place it in a, in a, a broader perspective than, than the question might have, uh, might have allowed for. Uh, that is what we're going, oh, Clayton, do you want to weigh in real quick? I, I, I'm just going to say from, I, Absolutely want to echo Dr. Kramer's uh, comments about, uh, of, of course, it, all these mechanisms in, in place to, to create a you know, safe place for learning and all that stuff. But I can also just tell you from, from years of experience that if we were explicitly told, don't talk about a thing, that silence is going to be quite loud in the classroom as well and would, would create just as much discomfort by specifically omitting it, it as, as it would. It, it, the, the only way that I see is, is to create a safe place for these discussions, to, to make pe people feel comfortable enough to, to, to express that. And, and again, by specifically limiting it, it's, it's only going to further snowball that discomfort. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And I know we're, we are now up against our, uh, our time limit. Uh, thank you to everybody on the panel for uh, your great insight and your response. Uh, to all of the questions tonight. I think it uh, uh, gave us a much better feel for uh, a lot of things, not just these two house bills, but also the, uh, the greater way of, of just dealing with education and in the, in the year 2021. Uh, that concludes the question and answer portion. Uh, I'm, thank you again for allowing me to moderate. I'm gonna turn it over now to Janet Parks for a few closing remarks. Janet. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um... I can't believe we've reached the end of this discussion. It was so stimulating. Uh, when we went out to choose a panel for this discussion, we wanted to get the best people possible. And I think we succeeded in that. Uh, I'm really impressed with your knowledge and your ability to express 
uh, all the information that you have. So thank you, thank you. I also want to uh, express our sincere appreciation to Cynthia Peoples, Alice Presley, and Michael Barron from the League of Women Voters of Ohio, our co-sponsors, the planning committee that was chaired by Lee McLaird, of course, the panelists, and Sharshare and Mel Tockel, our local technology gurus. We, gurus. we had high expectations for this discussion and all of you managed to exceed them. Uh, again, I wanna give a special note of appreciation to Steve Kendall for graciously accepting our invitation to moderate on such short notice. As always, Steve, your expertise and experience were evident as you guided the panelists through these very complex issues. Thank you so much. I wanna especially thank the audience for your time and attention. If you have further questions or comments, uh, you can send them to a, a website that we have where they will be directed to the appropriate persons. That, that link is about to appear on your screen. It's the lwvbgmeetings at gmail.com. And someone there will monitor that and direct it to the appropriate people. And from what I saw in the chat, we do have some remaining questions and comments and we'd love to hear them. Uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, this program was recorded and soon afterwards it will be posted on the LWVBG YouTube channel. Now, on a final note, I wanna remind you that a general election is coming up on November 2nd with early voting beginning on October 5th. You can check your registration status at vote411.org. And if you find that you're not registered, you may also register on that site and you must do so by October 4th. Information about candidates in local races will be published in an insert in the September 28th issue of the Bowling Green Sentinel Tribune. And in the near future, that same information will also be posted at vote411.org. As a last reminder, we hope you will be able to join us on October 3rd at our popular candidates forum to be held in the Lynn Hart Grand Ballroom of the Bowen Thompson Student Union. We've invited all candidates for the Bowling Green City Council and the Bowling Green Board of Education to present their ideas and to respond to questions from the audience. Additional details about that event are posted at lwvbg.org. For those unable to attend in person, the forum will be live streamed from WBGU PBS and later posted at lwvbg.org for viewing on demand by the public. Thank you so much for attending and good night.